Alrighty, hi. Um, it, today what we're going to do is treat um, a couple of the, the problematics that arise from reading uh, the, a couple of works from David Hume, Treatise on Human Nature and an Inquiry Concerning uh, Human Understanding. These two works are interesting. Uh, the Treatise on Human Nature was an early work written by Hume in his 20s when he, um, as he later characterized himself, um, was filled with youth, youthful arrogance. Um, and by his own characterization, uh, the book was a flop, or as he put it, um, fell still warm from the press. He wrote it specifically um, to get under the skin of everyone and make a splash or a sensation in sort of the academic world of his time. Unfortunately, nobody read it, nobody paid attention. Well, almost nobody read it. Um, later on, uh, he had applied for a teaching position, and it turns out that somebody had actually been paying attention. Um, Hume, it's a little anecdote about Hume, was one of the uh, first uh, Western philosophers to come out outright as an atheist. Right, he, it, most philosophers, have, as we've seen from Descartes and Spinoza as examples, took great pains to actually set themselves up at least in, as, as being consistent with the, the dominant theism of the day. Hume, on the other hand, as we've seen from the readings, um, it, it was an admitted atheist. And right. so um, when he applied for this teaching job later in his life, uh, the, the person on the hiring board who uh, it turns out had read his earlier work, um, it, it pointed out its atheism and he was denied, denied the position. Sort of as a compensation, he became first tutor to a madman um, and then secretary to a general and an outrageous fop of a general like that. Uh, he held several more sort of less less interesting positions throughout his life, um, and uh, turns out he eventually he wound up with a stipend, and by which he did not really have to work anyway. So um, this is David Hume. Um, so the first work, uh, the Treatise on Human Nature, is his early early work, and much later in his life, after tutoring a madman, after being turned down for an academic post, and after. After um, having worked as a secretary for an outrageous fop of a general and traveled all the uh, all around while doing so, he sat down to rewrite this earlier flop and presented it as two works, um, one of which being an inquiry concerning human understanding. So. Um, Actually, in the inquiry, uh, he tells you that in uh, the section of the preface um, at the beginning, where he tells you not to read the first work, just to read the second work, please ignore everything I wrote and the outrageousness of my youth. Right. So uh, we have two very interesting works from David Hume. And uh, like I say, we've been pretty heavily steeped in the rationalist tr tradition with um, so far Descartes and Spinoza. It's important that we introduce a, uh, an empiricist. Right? So um, with regard to your quiz questions, which I've printed a copy of here, um, I've isolated three sort of problematics. Um, I'm going to start with the second uh, concerning Hume's empiricism, move on to the third um, uh, concerning Hume's account of causality, and then move back to uh, the, the interesting bit for our course theme on um, knowing thyself on Hume's treatment of personal identity in this video. Um, this is going to be a very brief video. I take Hume to be a whole lot more clear and straightforward than um, what you've gotten used to and have come to expect from Spinoza. So uh, to start off with, um, the, the second of your quiz questions reads, um, and this is from page 540 to 541, um, that Hume asserts, when we entertain, therefore, any suspicion that a philosophical term is employed without any meaning or idea, as is, uh, but, uh, as is but too frequent, uh, we need but inquire, from what impression is that supposed idea derived? And if it's impossible to assign any, this will serve to confirm our suspicions. 
By bringing ideas into so clear a light, we may, uh, we may reasonably hope to remove all dispute which may arise concerning their nature and reality. And uh, the question F, uh, uh, ooh, excuse me, asks you to offer a brief account of the arguments supporting this assertion. So um, this is uh, it just straight from section two um, of the inquiry concerning human understanding, um, uh, the origin of ideas, where Hume just very clearly in using these two examples argues that all ideas that are worth their salt find their root in some sort of sense impression, right? So even uh, our complicated ideas, our imaginary ideas, like the idea of a golden mountain or a pink donkey or something along those lines, find their root in some sort of sense impression. And what's more, those sensations, those sense impressions, find themselves to be more lively than our abstract or uh, more complicated notions, right? So ultimately, all thought uh, finds its root in sensation, right? So um, it, this is an interesting principle um, that, that empiricists wind up citing, and he gives you uh, two examples. The first you find on uh, 539. Do, 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 do. Uh, first, when we analyze our thoughts or ideas, however compound or sublime, we always find that they uh, resolve themselves into such simple ideas as were uh, copied from uh, precedent Feel, feeling or sentiment, even those ideas which at first view seem to be the uh, the most wide uh, wide of this origin, are found upon near scrutiny to be derived from it. The idea of God as uh, meaning an infinitely intelligent and wise and good being arises from reflecting on the opera operations of her own mind and augmenting without limit those qualities of goodness and wisdom. So um, this has to do with, and it, to a certain extent, we can um, understand the, the qualities of a divine being, even in somebody like St. Thomas Aquinas, supremely perfect, um, omnipotent, omniscient, etc., etc. These are just extreme or perfect versions of human moral qualities that we would like to emulate, right? So all-knowing God, we know a little bit, God knows it all omnibenevolent kind of thing. It's, it's, I'm a little benevolent, right? When I see somebody in need, I try to help, but God is omnibenevolent. He has a perfect beneficence, right? Etc. 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 So really what we're doing, even in these ideas that are so supposedly removed from experience is uh, taking something from experience and abstracting and abstracting and abstracting away from it. And he's got an argument in favor of that position. Um, the second argument in favor of this, um, this position with regard to impressions that he offers, uh, you find on 540. Secondly, if it happens from a defect of the organ that a man is not susceptible to any species of sensation, we always find that he is as little susceptible of the correspondent ideas. A blind man can, from uh, no notion of uh, 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 can form no notion of colors. A deaf man of sounds restore either of them to uh, th that sense in which he is deficient by. Um, uh, de, oh, excuse me, deficient by opening this new uh, inlet uh, for his sensations, you also open an inlet for ideas, and he finds no difficulty in conceiving these objects. Right? Um, the, the case is the same if the object proper for exciting any sensation has never been applied to the organ. Um, a good example of this might be um, certain cultures have lots and lots and lots of words to describe different kinds of snow. Um, if you're a Star Trek fan, um, you might actually be familiar with the Ferengi, where it was actually, you know, it's sort of fictively asserted that the Ferengi, since it's so bloody rainy on their home world, have over 
200 words for rain. Right now it's sloshing, right? Which is sort of a wet, sticky rain, etc., etc., right? So um, what we find is that, um, in fact, if we are denied the sensations that actually operate as an inlet for certain kinds of experience and certain kinds of idea, uh, then um, if, if we're deficient in that respect, then we lack the idea to correspond to the sensation, right? So um, ultimately what uh, Hume wants to do is establish this principle, um, which you'll find on the bottom of uh, 540 to 541. Um, it's it, it basically asking um, it, us to explain our f philosophical terms in terms of their sensations. Um, so he wants to claim that if your philosophical term or philosophical idea cannot be traced back to some form of sense impression, and get this, this is this is very consistent for an empiricist to argue, then that idea has no referent. Right? So literally, it would be nonsense. Right. So, um, this is the first of your questions, and that's where you find um, what I'm asking you to do for that question is to basically trace in some detail this argument as, as it's offered by Hume. Um, there is one important caveat that um, he makes. He, he addresses a contradictory phenomenon, but nonetheless, um, he wants to argue that this might actually have to do with um, the sense impression as well. Bugger, Windows 10. Is this all messed up? No. Okay. Um, it, so clearly, I've been having some computer computing difficulties here. Um, I, I, I think dude, stupidly, I've updated to Windows 10, um, and it's uh, yeah, making things a little bit buggy here for me. So uh, please bear with me. Okay, so um, that was the second of your questions here. You see, this is much more straightforward than uh, Spinoza was. Um, uh, question three, I said I was going to start at two, move to three, and then move back to uh, question one. Um, question three, these, these are the important ideas that come from um, this particular reading. I'm just trying to isolate the absolutely important ones. Um, there is a very interesting critique of Spinoza contained in these works as well. Um, but I'm going to leave that to you. Um, <clears throat> it, it per, perhaps it might be a good way to frame a, uh, a, a final writing assignment topic because I'm asking you to offer critique as well. So, um, it, question three. Uh, in section four of an inquiry concerning human understanding, Hume uses the example of the motion of billiard balls to illustrate a fundamental problem with our account of causality. Offer a brief account of this argument. Now, uh, what I want you to do is um, it, it, a little bit more detailed than what um, I am uh, about to do myself here, right? Um, darn, where did it go? Uh, section four of an inquiry, right? Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah entitled uh, Skeptical Doubts uh, Concerning the Operations of uh, the Understanding. Now, um, is, since everything has to be traced back to a sensation, um, there can be uh, but two kinds of, of uh, inquiry, he claims here. Uh, relations of ideas, and we're familiar with this from Descartes and Hume and geometry and any sort of deductive argument that you might come across where um, logical entailment is uh, involved. It's, it's, I was, uh, my daughter's kind of thing. It's, it's, I, I let loose a statement and about my daughter Beatrix being a twin, right? She's being a twin all by herself. There's a problem with logical entailment there. Being a twin isn't something that you can do by yourself. It necessarily entails the existence of another person who's your twin, right? So uh, this is just within the realm of the relations of ideas, and this does not necessarily rely on sense data, right? It's abstract, right? So, and necessarily by Hume's argument in the uh, preceding section, um, it, it, it fainter and less lively, right? So. Um, uh, that's that's the one kind of um, inquiry that human reason is possible of, 
and uh, relate in matters of fact is uh, the other form of um, inquiry that human reason is capable of. Now, very quickly, and like I say, I'm asking you to do something a little bit more detailed than what I'm going to do here. Very quickly, what Hume wants to argue is that um, most of the interesting things that we can say, all of the interesting things that we can say about nature rely on this notion of cause and effect. Right? And interestingly, cause and effect must, by its very nature, Right, rely on and uh, our understanding of cause and effect must rely on experience or sense impressions. Right, so any of these statements like "what goes up must come down," "every action has an equal and opposite reaction," etc., etc., and um, or any of the other sort of inductive inferences. He uses the example of somebody coming across a watch or some sort of other mechanical um, device on a deserted island or something along those lines. The inference is, well, you know what? It's it's uh, another human being must have been here at some point, right? So, right? These are inferences. The some the human being must have been here to cause this watch to be on this deserted island, etc., etc., right? Well, all of these are not deductive, but rather inductive, right? Which, um, if you took my 101 class, it's, um, to some extent, uh, this was covered in my treatment of Plato's Phaedrus. A deductive argument is one where um, it's it's the, 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 the conclusions necessarily follow the, pre follow the premises. Whereas an inductive argument is one where the conclusions uh, are supported strongly but not necessarily by the premises, right? So what Hume argues is all uh, all sort of uh, arguments concerning nature, right? Which are the really interesting sort of arguments that we get into. The really interesting sort of inferences that we have to make, right? Are only inductively rather than deductively valid. Right? Because insofar as they rely on sense experience and insofar as um, it, it, the, the arguments stand, they can it be either true or false. Right? Um, the, the, the conclusions do not necessarily follow, but are really only strongly or, or hopefully strongly supported by the evidence. Right? So. Um, what Hume wants to argue is that all of these arguments rely on this notion of cause and effect, which it, generally we can, it, it, when we make a causal argument, these causal arguments tend, tend to be pretty strong, but the principles upon which we make the causal argument, uh, one, have to be based on experience, and two, are actually fairly uh, dogmatically accepted according to Hume. Right. Um, so, according to this argument by Hume here, um, it, it, in terms of experience, when uh, we realize that um, there, 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 something has happened, right? And he uses the example of billiard balls, like one billiard ball striking another billiard billiard ball, right? Uh, we tend to understand that that causality based on our past experience, right? And in terms of that causality. Right? The past experience obligates uh, future experience. So when we see a billiard ball strike another billiard ball in a particular way, we can expect a certain kind of motion right? to come uh, to result as a result of the causal forces at work there. But interestingly, um, and this is just the, the sort of crib notes version of this, we can ask on the basis of the previous argument that we were discussing here, uh, this requires a principle, as he points out on 544. In a word, then, every effect is a, a distinct event from its cause. It could not, therefore, be discovered in the cause and the first uh, <coughs> invention or conception of it a priori must be entirely arbitrary. And even after it, it is suggested, the conjunction of it will uh, excuse me, the conjunction of it with uh, the, the cause must appear equally arbitrary since there are always 
many other effects which, to reason, uh, must seem fully as consistent and natural. In vain, therefore, um, should we pretend to determine any single event or infer any cause or effect without the assistance of observation and experience. All right. Now, what Hume is driving at in this particular se section is that when we it deploy our it, our understanding of cause and effect predictively. Well, if that billiard ball hits that one there, like any time we play billiards or pool or anything along those lines, we do this. We do this as golfers. We do this as basketball players. We do this as drivers. Basically, we are employing a principle that says that all events that happened in a certain way will continue to operate in that particular way. So for example, if I'm bouncing a ball against the wall and the ball bounces back to me and I catch it, if I do that 50 times on the basis of that evidence of it bouncing back to me 50 times, you would think I'd be justified just by the repeatability that in saying that if I bounce this ball against that wall a 51st time, it will bounce back at but, in order to make that claim, in order to justify that claim, in order to give evidence for that claim, I have to give evidence for a principle that says actions that happened in the past must obligate actions in the future. Or put another way, you know, this principle itself is valid. And based on experience, we cannot justify that principle, even if we bounce the ball a thousand or a million times against the wall. All we really have evidence of is the fact that it bounced back those hundred, thousand, million, fifty, fifty-one times in the past. All right? So, in terms of grounding a rational system, the, the principle that, 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 that supports and undergirds causality is merely reliable. It's not necessary. All right? So in one foul th thrust, right, what Hume did as a result of um, this argument is called question to all of the empirical sciences. Because if you think about it, what is an experiment? Really, you want to test a principle. What you do is you come up with a high hypothesis, set up a whole series of controls, right? and watch an experiment and see what happens. And then you repeat and repeat again and repeat again to make sure your observations weren't just a fluke. And as a result of all of that, inductively, and this is the problem of induction here. What you do is inductively justify a principle that you extract from that experience in order to establish claims justified by that principle about all sorts of possible futures. You see, it's predictive, but this inductive inference tries to reach it further than it can. So in one fell swoop, what Hume has done, even, even though he and his life actually claimed that the experimental sciences, in fact, do have a lot to offer humanity, right, he called question fundamentally to the basis of the experimental sciences. We can't even establish the principle uh, that puts into place causality. Right? So this is part of the reason why I find Hume just fascinating. He's a fascinating theorist, right? as far as I know. We have not licked the problem of induction. We haven't, right? But nonetheless, our sciences, our experimental sciences, chug steadily along into the future, right? It, it's good enough that they work, right? Um, it, in terms of epistemology, if you wind up uh, taking an epistemology class, um, there is an epistemological position called reliable, reliable process theory, right? Where, you know, you are justified in making a knowledge claim if the process by which you have made that knowledge claim if the process itself is reliable. Now interestingly and it's, I think back to my undergraduate epistemology class I wrote a paper about Spider-Man and the spider sense. The spider sense by that same sort of 
uh, theory of justification, right, which undergirds any good epistemology, right, is a perfectly valid way of knowing. So Spider-Man knows on the basis of this somewhat magical shping, shping, shping spider sense that something will happen in the future. And there's something shifty, therefore, about reliable process theory because it's an epistemological position that cannot account for itself in any way except to claim, well, it seems to work. <clears throat> it's worked reliably in the past, so it must... But again, induct pro Hume's problem of induction. So um, it, what I'm asking you to do is to treat that. Now, finally, with regard to um, Hume and his, his treatment of um, personal identity, it's in section six of A Treatise on Human Nature. Um, it's an interesting position. I like this, um, except insofar as it pretty well undercuts any notion of personal identity. All right. So on the basis of what we've seen already, any idea that's going to be founded and have any sort of philosophical worth whatsoever, that idea has to be traced back to some sort of sensation. Now, in order to have some form of personal identity, right, what we have to do is trace that identity back to a sensation and for you to be able to say, I'm the same person I was and will be that same person tomorrow. What Hume wants to argue is that there has to be a sensation that is constant and ever-present, right? Hume claims. Do, 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 do. Where is it here? Yeah, here it is, 526. Unluckily, all of these positive assertions are contrary to that very experience, which is uh, pleaded for them, nor have we any idea of self after the manner it is here explained. For from what impression uh, could this idea be derived? You see, he's applying his own principle there. For this question, it is impossible to answer without manifest contradiction and absurdity, and yet it is a question which must necessarily be answered if we would have the idea of self-pass for clear and intelligible. It must be some one impression that gives rise to every real idea. But self or person is not any one impression, but that to which are several impressions and ideas are supposed to have reference. If any impression gives rise to the idea of self, that impression must continue invariably the same throughout the whole course of our lives since self is supposed to exist after that manner. But there is no impression constant and invariable. Pain and pleasure, grief and joy, passions and sensations succeed each other and never all exist at the same time. It cannot, therefore, be from any of these impressions or from any other that uh, the idea of self is derived, and consequently there is no such idea. But further, what must uh, become of our particular perceptions upon this hypothesis? They're different and distinguishable and separable from each other and may be separately considered and may exist separately and have no need of anything to support their existence. After what manner, therefore, do they belong to self and how are they connected with it? For my part, when I enter, <clears throat> enter most uh, intimately into, into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or another of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never catch myself at any time without a perception and uh, never can observe anything but the perception. All right? And then he continues a little bit um, further over to the other column of the page. If anyone upon seriously, uh, serious and unprejudiced reflection thinks he has a different notion of himself, I must confess I can, no longer re uh, uh, I can reason no longer with him. 
I <clears throat> all I can allow him is that he might be uh, in the right as well as I, and that we are essentially different in this particular. He he may perhaps perceive something simple and continued, which he calls himself, though I'm certain there is no such principle in me. So. What Hume wants to do is treat personal identity in terms of his epistemology, right? And we can have no idea that's not derived directly from it, a sense impression or a sensation. So unless we can isolate that sensation or impression X in us, which is constant and invariable throughout our entire lives, which is difficult because we go to sleep and have no sensation sometimes, Right? which is difficult because really how we perceive has changed over and over and over again through time. Uh, well, unless we can come up with some sort of principle to explain this, then we have no basis for our idea of self or personal identity. Right? So ultimately what Hume wants to argue is that we are, it's, and this is very similar to Buddhist philosophy that, that operates on the doctrine of anatman or the no-self, right? That, in fact, we are just these bundles of perception, and what really gives rise to the idea of a consistent self is, um, well, poo things, right? Um, over on 530, he claims, and here it's evident we must confine ourselves to resemblance and causation and must drop contiguity, which has little or no influence on the present case, right? So he wants to claim that resemblance and causation, right? Because generally when we experience an object and it resembles another object, we have a very smooth transition between our sensation of that object and the next, or even right, our experience of change. Right? If we see something on our path every day, we're, easy, we're easily convinced that what we are perceiving is the same object in a state of change, etc., etc., etc. So it's a smooth sort of mental transition. So here, um, he treats resemblance and causation and causation by way of memory in order to account for how we come to have an idea of self, even though there is no empirical basis for the idea of self. Right? So when you start asking yourself for him, what does it mean to come to know yourself? Well, there's no consistent object called self. And I mean, it's understood in a particular way. He's he's used this um, as an example in terms of, it's, it's sort of an analogy between um, how we understand identity in terms of plants and animals, even though these things constantly change, right? So your question, in section four, an inquiry concerning human understanding, he uses the example of, what well, wrong oh. That's right, I was not going one, two, three, I was going two, three, one. So back to one. In section six of a treatise on human nature, Hume offers an account of personal identity, arguing that we can understand this notion in terms of that identity which we attribute to plants and animals, there being a great analogy between it and the identity of self and person. Being sure to offer a brief account of Hume's treatment of resemblance and causation, which I just directed you to there, um, in this section, discuss his account of personal identity. So when we ask ourselves, what does it mean for David Hume to, uh, to act on the, the Delphic prescription, the Delphic axiom, know thyself, right? There essentially is no permanent self to come to know. This is why I set this up in the course in terms of the limits to our self-knowledge. Descartes was limited in a particular way. Spinoza limited in another particular way. Right? 
remember uh, the, the we are aspects of God more or less God, it, God as a perfect being can lack nothing and we are something so God cannot lack us <laughs> so essentially right we are finite aspects of God and by Spinoza's account only see two of uh, the multitude the the infinite number of aspects right we only understand two of the infinite aspects of God Right, so by means of these very, so we're very limited when it comes to self-knowledge here. In terms of him, there's just no there, there. Right. So essentially, when we look at the self and actually break it down, what we find is sense impression related to sense impression related to sense impression, and we come up in terms of these bundles of sensations and impressions that are united very shakily through resemblance and memory. Right? So Hume is fascinating. Ultimately for Kant, um, what we'll find in the next section, and I'm excited to actually start Kant, is that uh, there is such a thing uh, for Kant is a noumenal self, a self which is transcendental, an ego which is other, but Kant's going to claim that it is absolutely unknowable to us. It only acts as a principle. Right? So um, we're nearing the end of this course. I'm having fun with this material. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your responses to this next quiz. Um, the last thing that um, I'm pointing out to you here is um, in terms of uh, your discussion forum. Um, this is the last thing. Um, Hume asserts, in short, all of the materials of thinking are derived either uh, from either either our outward or inward sentiment. A mix, uh, the mixture and composition of these belongs alone to the mind and will, or to express myself in philosophical language, all of our ideas or more feeble per uh, perceptions or copies of our impressions or more lively ones. Hume supports this position by offering two arguments. I already mentioned that. Discuss these arguments and their consequences. So, Hume, class, class, Hume. Hume, empiricist. I've introduced you to empiricism. Um, now I can call this an early modern philosophy class. Right. Now, uh, in the next section, we are going to do, as my boss says, the uh, concluding da 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 can't moment. So, um, it, please email me if you have questions. I'll do my best to get back to you in a timely manner. And uh, have good days, one for each of you.